Okay, good morning, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study coming to you live from St. Francisville, Louisiana. Thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate your company. We are working through the text of the Pentateuch, the five books, week by week, following the Jewish annual cycle of readings, and today's reading one of my favorites, is called Yitro. It is, uh, it's called Yitro, and it covers from Exodus chapter 18 and verse 1 through Exodus chapter 20 and verse 23, one of the highlights of this particular week's portion, uh, is that it contains within it the ten words. And uh, we're not going to go in great depth on the 10 words themselves in this particular class. I have done a complete series on those 10 words. Many of you were with me when we did that. Uh, But I do want to remind people that on my academia page, there is a document that will be quite helpful in your personal studies and it's called A Comparison of the Ten Words in English. In this particular document, what I've done is I've placed the version, we have two versions of the ten words in the Hebrew Bible. We have other intertext, which refer to the ten words, which we'll talk about another time. Uh, But Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 uh, present for us a version of the ten words. And in this particular document, what I did was I placed Exodus 20 side by side with Deuteronomy 5, my personal translation of these Hebrew words, and then I highlighted any differences between the two. So I would encourage you to get that. It's on my academia page, and uh, I will, let me go ahead and post a link to that while I'm thinking about it rather than ask someone else to do it. I had it pulled up because I wanted to print my own copy this morning, so if I needed to reference that. So I'm posting that now, that link, and I encourage you to get that and study it in your leisure. Okay, it's now posted, a comparison of the ten words. But this particular Torah portion is called Yitro, and as you might imagine, because of the name, Uh, As the name implies, this reading involves at least in part uh, something about the Midianite father-in-law of Moses. Now, in Exodus chapter 18, one of the parts that deals with Yitro in this particular reading is where uh, Yitro watches Moses from a distance. He's at the camp with the children of Israel, and he sees Moses. Moses is before the children of Israel, and this goes on all day. People are lined up. They go before Moses, and Yitro evidently is watching from a distance, and after quite some time, probably when Moses comes in for dinner, uh, Yitro asks him, what is it that you're doing? Obviously, I'm paraphrasing. And uh, Moses tells him about the judicial aspects of his role and how he stands there and people bring matters before him. In Exodus chapter 18, Yitro tells him that that's not sustainable, that by doing so, he's going to wear himself out and probably wear out the people. You know, they're having to wait in long lines and you, you need to set up a system. You ought to select certain key leaders from within the community that can help carry the burden of leadership. And then he gives him this method whereby that this could be uh, sustainable going forward. And, uh, and, and he tells him, you know, if God is for this and approves of it, you know, so forth and so on. Now, that's one version of the story. Uh, that's the Exodus version. In Exodus, it tells us a story about Yitro and advising Moses and and Moses accepting this. And and, and by the way, this happens according to Exodus 18. This version of the story uh, of the burden of leadership, let's call it, happens before the revelation of Sinai. 
Now, there's another version of the story of the burden of leadership and how leaders ought to be selected and they ought to be placed in a position of uh, leadership judgment, if you will. And that version comes to us in Deuteronomy chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. The interesting thing about the differences between these two versions is Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9 and following, you can tell by reading it horizontally with uh, Exodus chapter 18 that it is the same. It's the same if you back up a little bit, uh, but it, it's got some differences. Number one, Deuteronomy knows nothing or makes no mention of Yitro's involvement in that, uh, that leadership solution to the leadership uh, burden of leadership. And the other thing that's different, and this is interesting as well, is that according to Deuteronomy 1, it takes place after the revelation at Sinai. So I encourage you, as we always want to do, to discern what it is that we're looking for here. We want to compare horizontally. You know, we want to look at if a text mentions a certain thing that takes place and we have another text which mentions something similar, we want to look at those side by side. But that is not what I'm talking about today. I bring it up because Yitro is the person for whom this particular Torah portion is called. Now, we know this Midianite father-in-law of Moses, but we know him in our source material by no less than four names. He is called Ruel, Jethro, or Yitro in Hebrew, Jether, and then Hobab, the son of Ruel, in yet another text. Now, you have to forgive the southern humor, but I always think about when I hear Hobob, uh, my listeners in the south, particularly the southern United States, don't have any problem with a man having four names, particularly if one of them has Bob on it, whether it's Jim Bob or Joe Bob or something like that. So Hobob, uh, being one of the four names of Jethro, Jether, Ruel, Hobob, is perfectly acceptable to my southern listeners. Uh, excuse that poor uh, humor. However, and this is important, the Midianite connection, the Midianite connection to the biblical story and for the biblical writers uh, is quite important. It's, it's quite important, and you will see that to be the case as we work through the Torah's story, the Pentateuch story, particularly about uh, Israel's transference from the land of Egypt to the promised land. Now, I brought this up when I was working through the book of Genesis, and I think it's important to highlight it. For some reason, the writers have Midianite associations with Israel going into Egypt. You'll recall this if you go with me uh, this morning to the book of Genesis. Let's just make a quick reminder on this. Genesis chapter 37. In Genesis 37, let's look at verse 28. Uh, and it says, <clears throat> Midianite traders passed by. And they pulled Joseph up out of the pit. And they sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who brought Joseph to Egypt. Now the reason I want to highlight this is because there is a Midianite association with Israel vis-a-vis -vis Joseph going into Egypt, which ultimately, as you know in our story, leads to the children of Israel going into Egypt as well. Joseph is sent ahead of his family, uh, unbeknownst to them at the time, uh, to bring about a great salvation for the people of Israel. So here we have the Midianites being involved in that bringing of Joseph and ultimately Israel into Egypt. Look down at verse 36 of Genesis chapter 37. 
In verse 36 it says, The Midianites, meanwhile, the Midianites, meanwhile, sold him, meaning Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar, a courtier of Pharaoh and his chief steward. So the question becomes, and we work through this material and the difficulties and challenges of these uh, texts, the difficulty is, who is it? Is it the Midianites? Is it the Ishmaelites? Well, if you look at Judges chapter 8, verse 24, which we're not going to do at this moment, you'll find that there's a close association between Midianites and Ishmaelites. But one of the points that I want to bring up is that early in this patriarchal narrative, we find uh, Midianites in the land of Israel. Remember, this takes place in the Jezreel Valley, this transferring of Joseph to the land of Egypt. Uh, these Midianites are traders, and they're, they're working the trade routes, bringing various items uh, for sale into the land of, of, uh, of Egypt. And so it's interesting, I'd just like to bring up it, that it's interesting to see the involvement of Midianites in the story of Israel going to Egypt and then also on the coming there out, okay? So what is the writer trying to tell us? It's, it just, it's worth noting that Midianites are involved in the in as well as the exodus. Now, a study of Midian, Midianite, Midianites is a worthwhile investigation, particularly in the early history of Israel and throughout the biblical period. You know, we have encounters with the Midianites. Not only are they, uh, as I pointed out, involved in the entry and the exit of Israel from Egypt, but we encounter the Midianites not only in Moses' new family, but we encounter the Midianites in the book of Bamidbar, in the book of Numbers, in the Transjordan region, where they lead Israel, I might add, willingly into some pretty bad things. Uh, and then later in the biblical period, we find the Midianites in the book of Judges and, you know, the story where they're battling against the people of Israel. And so, uh, interesting group, interesting group. Now, if we can rightly trust the genealogies that are given to us uh, in, in Genesis as a means of identifying a people group, what we learn from Genesis chapter 25, particularly verse 2 and 3, is that Midian, if you trace back the, the name Midian, Midian is a descendant of uh, Abraham, and we find um, Abraham's descendant, or yeah, Abraham's son Midian, is descended through uh, his wife Keturah. You'll recall that from Genesis chapter 25 and verse 2. Now, several texts, several texts uh, within this particular, within the biblical narrative, place this people group, the Midianites, east of the Jordan Rift. In fact, Genesis chapter 25 tells us that Abraham uh, sends these, uh, this family group uh, through Keturah. Through Keturah uh, to the land of the east. And several other texts place the Midianites uh, to the east, we'll just say. Now, the thing about that descriptor is that it's not as specific as we would like it to be. The land of the east is not as uh, specific as we would like. It just doesn't tell us as much. Now, there are some texts which indicate that east indicates a Transjordanian place, okay? Uh, but it's not always the case. So if we look at, say, Genesis chapter 36, verse 35, that's one example that indicates that at least in some way, the land of the east where the Midianites dwell is east of the rift. And when I say the rift, I'm talking about the Jordan you know, so Transjordanian areas, okay? 
And we also, in Numbers chapter 25 and then through chapter 31, where Israel is clearly in the Transjordan region, it's another place, another area of the text where we encounter this group called the Midianites. But we do find evidence in the biblical narratives where there, there is evidence that the children or the people of Midian are not always on the east side of the Jordan. In fact, there's no restriction in the biblical narrative that says that there's a dot on the map called Midian. Now, if you look at your map, you're going to find most often uh, that the Midianites are east of the rift and to the south, right? Uh, down around Aqaba and, and, uh, and so forth. But that's not necessarily where you'll find them. And part of that, I think, is due to the fact that there seems to be an association between the Midianites and these caravan routes, and uh, that seems to be one of the things that they are participating in is trade. So you're going to find them west of the rift. Now, why do I care about that? And some of you are saying, I don't know. Why is it important that we try to figure out where the Midianites are? And part of the importance of locating, let's call it the land of Midian, is there's a very important reason for us to be interested in this. Moses flees... Uh, to the land of Midian, put that in air quotes, after it became known that he's killed a man in Egypt. Go with me to Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 2, and verse 15. In Exodus 2.15, uh, we see the following. In Exodus 2.15, it says, When Pharaoh learned of the matter, meaning the death of, uh, brought about by Moses. He sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh. He arrived in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. All right. And it's not just that he flees to Midian that causes us to be interested in where that is located. Because the story works fine if you don't know where he flees to. You just know he left Egypt. He flees to the land of Midian. But part of the reason that this is so interesting is what follows in the narrative. So we learn that while Moses is in the land of Midian, and in fact, while he's at the well, he encounters uh, the priest of Midian's daughters who go there uh, to this well that he's sit, sitting at. And uh, we, we learn subsequently that the girls go back and tell Daddy, uh, Ruel, Jethro, Jether, Hobab, that an Egyptian man has saved them and it has expedited their work so that they got done quicker that particular day. Uh, Hobab invites them in. And uh, ultimately, Moses is given one of the seven daughters of the priest of Midian. And he, through this marriage with Zipporah, whose name is tied to a bird, uh, Zipporah and Moses have two sons. Now, we, we learn of the name of one of them earlier in the text. His name is Gershom. Because Moses names him Gershom, because Ger means a stranger or a sojourner. Shom in Hebrew is there. So he says, I'm a stranger there, and I have this son, so I'm going to name my son a stranger there. Uh, but in this week's Torah portion, we for the first time get the name of the other boy. So I want you to go with me this morning. Exodus chapter 18, we're still touching on this. Midianite connection <clears throat> in Exodus 18. Let's look at verse 3. And her two sons 
I'm picking this up where I want to pick it up because I'll go back and pick up the rest later. And her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom, that is to say, I've been a stranger in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, meaning the God of my father was my help and he delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. So you see, he is recalling that God has placed him in a strange land. He's a stranger in a strange land, and he has a child, and and he, he associates this being in the strange land with his flight from Pharaoh to save his life. So while Moses is exiled from Egypt, Uh, He's shepherding the flock of his father-in-law. And he arrives at a place that will forever alter his life's trajectory. It's a place that he calls Horeb. Horeb. I want you to go with me this morning to Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. He's shepherding his father-in-law's flock. Remember, he's staying with him in the land of Midian. And it says that he's on duty working the flock of the family and he drives them, this translation says uh, uh, simply, into the wilderness and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now there are a couple of things that we're going to talk about today. The first question is, you know, if we could figure out where Moses is at in Exodus chapter 3, aside from the the meager description that I just read, if we could somehow narrow that down, we could find where Horeb is. We could find where Sinai is, as it's called in another source. And the answer is, if I ask you, if I ask just about anybody, um, if they knew for sure, where is Horeb? Here's the answer, the first answer. The only true answer is we don't know for sure. Now, I know a lot of people, including me, have some pretty good ideas, but do we know for sure? Do we know for, uh, for certain? What we see is that it says that Moses drives the flock of his father-in-law into the wilderness, according to JPS. Uh, but that's not a very literal translation. In Hebrew, it's akar hamid bar, akar hamid bar. Now, in most translations, akar is left untranslated. So like you hear in this particular translation, the translator just skipped it all together. He came to Horev, I'm sorry, drove the flock into the wilderness, there's hamid bar, and came to Horeb. But it, it, the Hebrew says, Akar Hamid Bar. By the way, Akar Hamid Bar is only used one time in the whole Hebrew Bible. So one of the things that we do when we're trying to understand a term, a word, a phrase, we look at, uh, let me see other references. Let me see where else this is used. And, and maybe context in some of these other passages will help me identify um, what Akhar Hamid Bar means. In this case, we don't get that. There's no other occurrence of Akhar Hamid Bar. But some translations don't just say he's in the wilderness. They add a word. <clears throat> and the word they add, well, there's a couple of different options. One, some translations will say westward, and some say on the backside of the wilderness. I know some of you, I want you to look at your translation. What does your translation say? Does it say he drives them to uh, the west side or the back side of the wilderness? 
And what, first of all, you have to ask, what wilderness? What does it mean front and back? Well, here's a little geography lesson for us. <clears throat> In the Bible, the Dead Sea is called the front sea. All right. Now, I almost put my map up today, but I didn't. If the Dead Sea is the front sea and the Mediterranean Sea is at times referred to as the back sea, or it's, uh, it's tied to the root word akar, it's, it's also these directions are tied directly with the front is Kedem. The front is east. The backside, biblically, geographically, is called Ahar, the west, the back. And that indicates that the writers of the biblical text are trying to orient you. If you want to get your orientation down biblically, the east is in front of you. You're going to, you're going to face the east. And what is behind you a car can also mean to follow, so that which is behind you follows you. Uh, that's the West. So what we're, what we're getting at is that when Moses is driving the flock, he's going westward in the wilderness. He's not going eastward. There's a way that you would say, and he drove east into the wilderness, and that's not what this says. So I just want to get you oriented that Moses, from wherever Midian is, let's say Midian is in the land of the east, even though that's not very descriptive or it's not descriptive enough to help us, we know that from the land of Midian, he tra traverses westerly to go to Horeb. Now, that, that doesn't help us so much yet either. But I just want you to know that he's not going east from Midian. Midian is in the east, and he's headed west. Now, by the way, uh, part of what I'm talking about today is to help us to try to figure out for fun, if nothing else, where is Horeb? I posted a map on the... Uh, United Israel Facebook group, and I sent it out in our newsletter, in our UI bulletin. It's from BibleMapper.com, BibleMapper.com. I encourage you to look on the Facebook group page and get that map and or uh, open up your bulletin. By the way, if you've signed up for the bulletin and you're not getting it, go look at your junk file. Maybe it's going to spam or something because I have a, a real low open rate on those, and it may, my, maybe it shouldn't bother me, but it does. I wonder, do people think, uh, oh boy, another newsletter from United Israel? I can't see why you would say that. So go check your junk file, open it up. There's a link to this map, and in this map, there are given some 15, roughly, different proposed sites for Horeb. Now, which one is it? Is it uh, you know this one? Is it that one? You can look at these, and part of what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about the wilderness itinerary. So I want you to have this map. It is, in my opinion, the best map out there right now that I know of that includes all of these locations for proposed sites uh, for Sinai. Now, so we know that the location of Horeb is west of Midian. We know that. And we get also from certain texts that the location of Horeb is not far from Egypt. Now, if Midian is east of the rift and Horeb is west of Midian, then it's close, it's in between, let's say, Jordan and Egypt. Furthermore, if I'm right, and it's not far from Egypt, it's going to be closer 
You know, if you draw a line straight down through the Sinai Peninsula, as we call it now, wonder where it got that name. Sinai Peninsula. Was it called the Sinai Peninsula in biblical times? You know, it'd be a lot easier if it were, but it wasn't. But you draw a line through there and you say, okay, here's the center point. I'm west of that line or I'm east of that line. How do I figure out the location? We're looking for the biblical Horev. Now, a couple of indications make me think that it could be, could be, and stick with me on this, don't try to shoot them all down at once, it could be just a few days journey from the boundary of Egypt. And we get three texts which clearly indicate that the children of Israel request to make a three-day journey into the wilderness to worship God uh, at an unnamed hog, an unnamed festival, a feast. If you'll recall from the time that God meets Moses in Exodus chapter 3, before he reveals his name uh, to anyone, Exodus chapter 3 verse 12, he tells Moses, Elohim tells Moses that you're going to go get the people of Israel and you're going to bring them back to me and worship me on this mountain. And when Moses goes before Pharaoh, he requests on three different occasions, let us go three days into the wilderness. That's pretty specific. Now the question becomes, does he mean it literally? Or is he just looking for a three-day head start with two and a half million people? That's up for you to decide. Now, Another reason I believe that it's not far from the border of Egypt. These are all reasons, uh, data points along the way. Look at Exodus chapter 4 and verse 14. Now, in chapter 4, one of Moses' complaints or one of Moses' uh, attempts to shirk the responsibility of going to, to free the people is he says, I can't even speak well. Whether that means I don't know Hebrew or, or whatever, uh, remember he says he's of heavy tongue, only used in one other place, and that's in Ezekiel to indicate a person speaking a foreign language. But the bottom line is that in this argument where he makes the point that he can't speak uh, and they won't understand him, notice what it says in verse 14, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 4. And Jehovah became angry with Moses, and he said, There's your brother Aaron the Levite. He, I know, speaks readily. Even now he's setting out to meet you, and he will be happy to see you. Now this is interesting. Moses is where? And I pause. He's at Horeb. Aaron is where? He's in Egypt. And we're told in Exodus 4.14, God tells Moses that Aaron is on his way to meet you. Now that is interesting to me. Now, we, we have to figure out how does Aaron find Moses at Horeb and how far does he have to go to get there? I mean, do we get any indication? Let's keep going. Let's look at a couple of other things. Uh, if we want to get some directions, we want to get some directions. Here's what God tells Aaron in the land of Egypt. Remember, Aaron's in Egypt. Moses is at Horeb. Get that in your mind. Everybody got that? Chapter 4, verse 27. Jehovah said to Aaron. Now, these are the directions. You're in Egypt. God's going to give you directions. You ready for this? Go meet Moses in the wilderness. Go meet Moses in the wilderness. Now, is that uh, good directions? Let me look at something here. Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. Um, and it says um, in Hebrew, Lake Likrat Moshe 
Hamid Bara, go to meet Moses towards the wilderness. Now, you have to wonder. Now, of course, people can make uh, allowances for perhaps God guiding him, you know, and telling him, turn this way, turn that way. Or, or you could take the view that when you set out into the wilderness, you can't just walk a beeline to anywhere. There are certain routes whereby you can navigate through the wilderness. I mean, you could. You could walk over and up and down these deep wadis, and, or you could follow an established route. So if the command from God to Aaron is, hey, Aaron, go lek likrat, go meet Moses towards the wilderness. Well, he would know that when he walked out, he would head in a certain direction. Now, in my understanding, I also see, I don't think that this indicates that it's very far. It's somehow, if you're in Egypt and you begin to walk towards the wilderness, you're going to meet Horeb before you meet uh, Midian. Does that make sense? All right, look at chapter 4 and verse 19. Now, remember, this is after 4 and verse 14 is where God tells Moses, I'm sending your brother Aaron to meet you. Now, he's at Horeb. And then you see, uh, look at verse 18. Moses went back to his father-in-law Jether, Jether and said to him, Let me go back to my kinsmen in Egypt and see how they are faring. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. So all I want you to understand is Moses is at Horeb. He goes back to Midian. He heads east from wherever he's at. He heads in an easterly direction to get back to Midian. He meets with his father-in-law and says, Hey, I want to go back to Egypt. His father-in-law says, Go. What direction is he heading now? He's going to go west. All right? Now, Verse 19, and the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt. Now, this is almost, I want you to understand geographically, he could have said, head west, young man. Go back to Egypt for all the men who sought to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons, mounted them on an ass, and went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God with him. So, we now have Aaron, I'm sorry, Aaron, he's, Moses has been told, Aaron's coming to meet you. Moses goes back to Midian, picks up the wife and boys. They then start heading west. Aaron is told by Jehovah, you head to meet him in the wilderness. And guess where they meet up? They meet up in the middle. All right? Aaron is headed east into the wilderness. Moses is headed west into the wilderness. They meet somewhere. Now, that doesn't give us very specifically where the location of Horeb is, but at least gets us in a certain region. Okay. Now, um, look at verse 27. <clears throat> And the Lord said to Aaron, go meet Moses towards the wilderness. And he went and met him at the mountain of God, and he kissed him. So Aaron finds Moses, needle in a haystack, in the middle of the desert, somewhere at a mountain called the mountain of God. Now, by the way, Exodus 3 tells me, that Horeb is also called the mountain of God. So the same mountain. So they're at Horeb now. It says in verse 28, Moses told Aaron about all the things that Jehovah had committed to him and all the signs about which he had instructed him. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the Israelites. 
Now, this is like a condensed version. They, they meet at Horeb. Moses fills him in. Then they go to Egypt and go before Pharaoh. Now, how far do they go before they get there? I don't know. But right now, I want you to get the image. Moses, Zipporah, Gershom, and Eliezer, and Aaron meet at Horeb, at the mountain of God. Then they go to Egypt, and they begin this great confrontation between Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh. And then the greatness that is the Exodus takes place. And Moses and Aaron and Miriam lead the children of Israel after they depart, Beishalach, when Pharaoh let them go, they cross the sea. They travel to various staging points, and they're headed to one location, to the place where Moses and Zipporah and Gershom and Eliezer and Aaron met prior to the plagues. Now, a few things to consider. A few things to consider. The children of Israel are a large group. 2.75 million people most likely, give or take a few hundred thousand, uh, are going to take longer to get from point A to point B wherever point A and point B happen to be on the map. And the route that they would normally take was changed. So like if you knew the way to Horev, and you would normally go a certain route, say you begin the route by taking uh, the road, the way of the Philistines, Horus Road, uh, you, you're going to go instead of that way, you go a different way. It's not a straight shot. It's not the same route that Aaron took when he left Egypt uh, in chapter 4, verse 27, to just the directions were go meet Moses in the wilderness. He, he's going to take a different route this time. And part of that reason, if you recall, is because God doesn't want the children of Israel to encounter opposition and somehow become fearful and want to go back to Egypt, which they do anyway. But now... We have a record of the events along the way. Not only is it going to take longer with a large group than just, you know, four or five people, uh, not only is it going to be much more difficult and the route has been changed and it's not a straight shot, but they're going to encounter opposition anyway. They meet with a group in Exodus chapter 17 called the Amalekites, Amalek, the arch enemy, arch enemy of the children of Israel, the evil, evil people called Amalek. And they're going to encounter this people at a place called the wilderness of sin. Now, I grew up Baptist in the Southern Baptist Church. The preacher used to call that the wilderness of sin, and you know what the wild, what goes on in the wilderness of sin, right? In Hebrew, sin, now this is not sin. Hear the T-S. It's not sin. We're going to meet the wilderness of sin later. This is sin. It's a different wilderness. But they are at the edge of the wilderness of sin, and there's a battle with Amalek in the wilderness of sin. Now, we find something interesting here. I want you to go with me to Exodus chapter 17. I'm talking to you today about some of the difficulties in identifying the precise location of Horeb. You ready? Exodus 17 verse 1. From the wilderness of sin... The whole Israelite community continued by stages as Jehovah would command. And they encamped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. And the people quarreled with Moses. Give us water to drink, they said. 
And Moses replied to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you try Jehovah? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why would you bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? Moses cried out to Jehovah, saying, What shall I do with this people? Before, before long they'll be stoning me. And Jehovah said to Moses, Pass before the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take along the rod with you, which you struck the Nile, and set out, and I will be standing there before you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will issue from it, and the people will drink. I'm going to read that again. I will be standing there before you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will issue from it, and the people will drink. I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb. Horeb? Are they at Horeb? So I thought they're in the wilderness of sin at Rephidim. Now the question becomes, is Rephidim in the wilderness of sin, is it close to Horeb? Is Horeb at Rephidim? Is Horeb in the wilderness of sin? Are they on the edge? Do they walk a little ways and they're there? What's going on here? Must be in the vicinity, right? Look at chapter 18. Now this time, we're going to look at chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. Now just don't forget uh, Exodus 17, 6. We have the rock at Horeb. <clears throat> and by the way, uh, let me finish that. In Moses in Exodus 17, Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. The place was named Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tried Jehovah saying, Is the Lord present among us or not? Now get to 18. 18.1. <clears throat> Jethro, priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how Jehovah had brought Israel out from Egypt. So Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after she had been sent home, and her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom, and that is to say, I've been a stranger in a foreign land, and the other was named Eliezer, meaning the God of my father was my help, and he delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought Moses' sons and wife to him in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. <clears throat> now we know that at least Zipporah and the boys know the way. I don't know how old they are, but Zipporah knows the way to the mountain of God. She's been there before. She was there with Moses and Gershom and Eliezer and Aaron on their way to Egypt. Now before, and get this, this is often missed by people, before the confrontation, before the plagues, Moses sends Sipporah and the boys home. Now how far does he send them? He sends them on their own. How far do you think it is? It seems to me that it's probably not that far. He sends the wife and kids home, perhaps for their safety. Uh, who knows? But a lot of people miss this, that they're, they're with him when he goes. The confrontation with Pharaoh begins, and next thing you know, uh, Jethro Jether Ruel Hobab is sending word to Moses, hey, I'm coming in the wilderness and I got your, your wife and boys with me. You sent them home. Remember, I got them with me. I'm bringing them back. Uh, time with Paul Paul is over. You know, some of you can relate to Hobab's uh, trip back into the wilderness. So now they're going to meet back up at Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, I want you to understand that this mountain is called the mountain of God before the revelation at Sinai, which indicates to me 
that the mountain had some sense of holiness prior to the giving of the ten words, if you will. So whatever we're looking for in terms of Horeb, it must be a place known in antiquity from the ancient days as a place associated with religious ritual and so forth. Now, go with me to Exodus 19. Verse 1, on the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone forth from the land of Egypt, on that very day, they entered the wilderness of Sinai, having journeyed from Rephidim, they entered the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. Israel encamped there in front of the mountain, and Moses went up to God. What mountain? They're at Sinai. The question becomes, and this is part of the difficulty in all of this, is Exodus 19 out of place? And before you say, no, it can't be, uh, remember last week even we talked about how Exodus chapter 16 is out of place because uh, part of Exodus 16 mentions that the children of Israel ate manna for 40 years and were only at the beginning of the Exodus. So it's clearly a later edited text. So my question concerning Exodus 19, I'm trying to work through all this, is it out of place? It says that they arrive, they entered the wilderness of Sinai, but I thought they were already there. You see? You see how it becomes difficult. In chapter 17, they're at Rephidim, not in the wilderness of Sinai, but in the wilderness of Sin, and verse 6 mentions Horeb. If you go to chapter 16, look at 16.1. Setting out from Elim, the whole Israelite community came to the wilderness of Sin which is both between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Israel. So here we go. On the 15th day of the second month, remember they leave in the first month, 15th day. So you're talking about a month, right? In a month, they've reached Elim. Now, Elim... Uh, is you have Elim and Sinai, and the wilderness of sin is between them. Does that make sense? You can find this on most maps, even maps that aren't that accurate. The question becomes, it's been a month in Exodus 16 when they get to the wilderness of sin. Now, the wilderness of sin already, at least in chapter 17, verse 6, mentions Horeb might, must be right there. Now, what took them 30 days? You say, well, it, it can't be close. 30 days, you could be in, you know, all the way in Saudi Arabia by now. But is that what the text seems to suggest has happened? Well, let's look at Numbers 33. Numbers 33, beginning in verse 5. <clears throat> Remember, Numbers 33 is a record of the stages of the, the route. 33.5, the Israelites set out from Ramesses, going back to the beginning, and encamped at Sukkot. They set out from Sukkot and encamped at Etam, which is on the edge of the wilderness. They set out from Etam and turned toward Pihahirot, which faces Baal Zephon, they encamped before Migdal. They're still in Egypt. They set out from Peneha, he wrote, and passed through the sea into the wilderness. So this is early in the stage. Remember I showed you last week, I think, pretty convincingly, that the sea is close to Migdal. Migdal is in Egypt. Ergo, the sea that they crossed is coming out of the eastern side of the land of Egypt in the Nile Delta. And they passed through the sea into the wilderness. What wilderness? And they made a three days journey in the wilderness of Etam and encamped at Marah. They set out for Marah and camped, uh, came to Elim. 
And there were 12 springs in Elim and 70 palm trees. So they encamped there. And they set out from Elim and encamped by the Sea of Reeds. Now you're back at the Sea of Reeds. Huh. And they set out from the Sea of Reeds and encamped in the wilderness of Sin. And they set out from the wilderness of Sin and encamped at Dafka. They set out from Dafka and encamped at Alush. They set out from Alush and encamped at Rephidim. And it was there that the people had no water to drink. And they set out from Rephidim and encamped in the wilderness of Sinai. Numbers 33 has a few extra stops in it that are mentioned here that aren't mentioned in some of these other texts. Let me begin. In 33 verses 5 through 10 of Numbers, the children of Israel, it says, cross through the sea of reeds, then three days in the wilderness of Etam. Where's the wilderness of Etam? Well, it's right out of Egypt. Look at Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13. They set out, verse 20, Exodus 13, 20. Where is Etam? They go through the sea and into a wilderness. It's called the wilderness of Etam. If we could find the wilderness of Etam, we could identify what sea they just went through. <clears throat> they set out from Sukkot in Egypt and encamped at Etam at the edge of the wilderness. It's right there. Now, they head south. How do I know that? Because after a few stops, it says that they're camping at the Sea of Reeds. Now, this time they're not going to cross. They've already crossed the Sea of Reeds. Now they're going to camp at the Sea of Reeds, at Yom Suf. Now, if you look at, the reason I'm bringing up this level of detail is if you're looking at a map, you're going to find Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Elim, don't know. Dafka, don't know. This one, don't know. You know, all these other things. We know basically the wildernesses and we know some of the Egyptian names. A lot of the rest is speculative. We know Yom Suf. We know Yom Suf is the term that's applied to the Nile Delta region, the marshy, watery area there. We know that it's, it's also ascribed to the, uh, the body of water called the Gulf of Suez. And we also know that it's described as the Gulf of Aqaba is called Yom Suf. The wilderness of sin, Exodus 17, says that Rephidim, Rephidim is next. Wilderness of sin, Rephidim. Verse 6 of chapter 17 puts Horeb here. Numbers 33, again, list the wilderness, from the wilderness of sin. 33 tells us Dafka, Alush, Rephidim, wilderness of Sinai. Now, Exodus 19 seems to abbreviate the journey. Exodus 19, 1 and 2 again. On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone forth from the land of Egypt, on that very day they entered the wilderness of Sinai. Having journeyed from Rephidim, they entered the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. Israel encamped in front of the mountain. Now, the true story, the fullness of the route, doesn't just go, it just says in verse 2, gone from Rephidim, they enter Sinai. Well, what is that? They go from the wilderness of Sin, Dafka, Alush, Rephidim, wilderness of Sinai. There's six stops in there. You see how it's just conflated. It's just uh, it's given in, in a much abbreviated form. Now, once Israel reaches Horeb, uh, they're going to remain there for approximately one year. Let's say that they get there in, according to Exodus 19, in the third new moon after the Exodus. So still the first year, 
third new moon, they're at Sinai. Now look with me at Numbers, the book of Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 10, Numbers chapter 10 and verse 11. In the second year, on the 20th day of the second month, the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the covenant or of the pact, and the Israelites set out on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai. So they're there for about a year, after which they depart. Second year, 20th day of the second month. This means that from Exodus 19, or maybe 18, or maybe 17, through Numbers chapter 10, the children of Israel are at a place called Horeb, Sinai. One year. Now here, according to our sources, the children of Israel have an encounter with God, a national revelation, an awe-inspiring encounter with God such as never was seen before and likely never will be seen again like this. We don't know the exact date of this encounter, though it is called in Deuteronomy the day of assembly. Look with me at Deuteronomy 9. Deuteronomy 9, <clears throat> verse 10. And Jehovah gave me the two tablets of stone in, uh, inscribed by the finger of God with the exact words that Jehovah had addressed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. On the day of the assembly. Look at chapter 10, verse 4 of Deuteronomy 10.4. The Lord, Jehovah, inscribed on tablets the same text as on the first. Remember, he breaks them. That's for, don't, you don't know that yet. The Ten Commandments said he addressed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of assembly, and Jehovah gave them to me. Deuteronomy 18, verse 16. 1816, this is just what you ask of Jehovah your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear the voice of Jehovah my God any longer or see this wondrous fire any more lest I die. No date is given for this event which forever changed the course of history. Other than... It's called the day of the assembly, and we are right to put it in the third month. Now, tradition puts it on Sivan the sixth, right? The revelation, Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. We don't know exactly. A voice from the midst of the fire, Deuteronomy 9, 10, and 10, 4 mention this voice from the midst of the fire. Deuteronomy is very specific. You saw nothing. You, you heard a voice. Be careful. You didn't see anything. Exodus' story is a little bit different, but Deuteronomy is very, very clear on this. In fact, let's look at um, this idea of the voice from the midst of the fire. All you did was hear. Deuteronomy is real careful with this. Look at Deuteronomy 4.12. <clears throat> it says, Jehovah spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but you saw no shape, nothing but a voice. All right. Look at verse 15. For your own sake, therefore, be most careful, since you saw no shape, when Jehovah your God spoke to you at Horeb, out of the fire. Look at verse 33, chapter 4. Has any people ever heard the voice of a God speaking out of a fire as you have and survived? Look at verse 36. From the heavens He let you hear His voice to discipline you on earth. He let you see His great fire. And from, the, uh, from amidst that fire... 
you heard his word. Chapter 5, verse 4. Face to face, Jehovah spoke to you on the mountain out of the fire. And then he goes into, I stood between Jehovah and you at that time to convey these words. Now look down at verse 19 uh, of chapter 5. 19. Verse 22, I think, in English. I'm not sure. Jehovah spoke these words, those and no more. This is worth repeating. Jehovah spoke those words, those and no more. Some translations say, and he added no more. To your whole congregation at the mountain with a mighty voice, out of the fire, dense clouds, he inscribed them on two tables of stone which he gave to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness while the mountain was ablaze with fire, you came up to me, all your tribal heads and elders, and said, Jehovah our God has just shown us his majestic presence. We've heard his voice out of the fire. We've seen this day that man may live, though God has spoken to him. Don't let us die then. For this fearsome fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of Jehovah our God any longer, we shall die. For what mortal ever heard the voice of the living God speak out of the fire as we did and lived? You, Moses, go closer and hear all that Jehovah our God says. And then you tell us everything that Jehovah our God tells you, and we will do it. What was spoken from the midst of the fire that he added no more? Deuteronomy 10.4 calls in English, Deuteronomy 10.4 calls it the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 10.4. Um, the Lord inscribed, Jehovah inscribed on the tablets the same text as on the first, the Ten Commandments that He addressed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of assembly, and Jehovah gave them to me. Deuteronomy 4.13 calls them the Ten Commandments in English. He declared to you the covenant that He commanded you to observe the Ten Commandments. And he inscribed them on two tablets of stone. Exodus 34. Look at Exodus 34, 28. And he was there with Jehovah 40 days and 40 nights. He ate no bread, drank no water, and he wrote down on the tablets the terms of the the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And he added no more. These words called the ten words, the ten matters, the ten things, these are the words of the covenant. Ain't owed no more. Not other things on the tablets. People have often studied ancient uh, Near Eastern, you know, we found this tablet, it's written in cuneiform and It contains sort of laws and stipulations, and therefore on the tablets were these things. We know that's not true, biblically. I mean, it's true about the other tablets. But according to the Bible, the only thing written on these two tablets, the ten words that were spoken by Jehovah out of the midst of the fire on the day of assembly, and he wrote them himself. Exodus 31, verse 18. When he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, or of the pact, stone tablets inscribed with or by the finger of God. Exodus 32, verse 15. Thereupon Moses turned and went down from the mountain bearing the two tablets of the testimony, tablets inscribed on both their surfaces, this way and that way. They were inscribed on one side and on the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing, incised upon the tablets. But what 
precisely was written on him. I mean, what did he say? What were the words that were spoken on that day, the day of assembly, at Horeb, from the midst of the fire, to an assembled group of people in the most awe-inspiring event in the history of humankind. Well, we have two accounts. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Remember the sheet I told you about when I started? And there are differences between them. Some might say slight differences. But inquiring minds want to know. I want to know. What did God say from the mountain, from the midst of the fire? That's the most important set of words that have ever pierced into our atmosphere. And they deserve a special study. We did a several-week study, and I've written extensively on this. From this event forward, at a day unknown other than as a day of assembly, in a place whose location is debated, though known as Horeb or Sinai in other sources, ten words whose precise content has come down to us in two different versions. And yet, and yet, even given the challenges and the difficulties with what we have, we have enough to build a better world. The question becomes, what was it? What laws traditionally trace back to the year at Horeb or the year at Sinai? What can we learn from that which came forth from Sinai? Well, we'll have to see. And we begin to answer that next week. Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Have a beautiful week.